Okay, hello, and uh, welcome, thanks for coming. Uh, welcome to this talk about uh, rethinking software systems and friendly introduction about to behavioral programming. And uh, the question is, of course, let's start with what is behavioral programming? So behavioral programming is a programming paradigm, right? So it's really a way for people to think about complex systems or complex software in a way that's understandable to people but also can be, can be translated later for computers to actually execute. Uh, it was introduced in uh, 2010 by David Arell, Asaf Maron, and Gera Weiss. And it's based on something that's called scenario-based programming, which is another way of programming or modeling that was early, uh, developed in the early 2000s, again by Werner Dam, David Arell, and uh, Rami Morelli. Now, there's a large body of scientific work that uh, based about uh, on these concepts, but there isn't a lot of uh, industrial attention to, to this uh, system. There are impl implementations in Java, C++, Erlang, and in state charts. Um, but as far as the industry goes, DevOps is, uh, in fact, the first major non-academic uh, conference to host a behavioral programming talk, at least to the best of my knowledge. Uh, the actual first one I know of was uh, this October in uh, Italy, uh, using this, uh, these concepts for React by uh, Luca Mattis. So we can expect some weirdness here, right? This is a new way of thinking about software. It's going to be weird. It's going to be, if you can think back to the time you first saw functional programming and you got a list of things, and you were supposed to iterate through the list, but you know, the paradigm took the for loop away. And you kind of like, what do I need to, to recourse in order to go through all the elements? And or f first time you saw object-oriented polymorphism, and you were told that you can invoke the same method on these two objects, and because they're different somehow, they'll do different things. And that's that's kind of weird, right? Because if any object can just decide what they want to do, I mean, this is starting Skynet right there, right? So. We're, we're looking at the weird thing, but if I do my work job correctly here, it's going to be weird in a good way. And if not, we'll just have to wait for the next talk. So it, it's going to be weird, but it's also going to be slightly more weird than, than just another programming paradigm, because behavioral programming is also a modeling paradigm. So in programming, I mean, we are, we're all programmers, right? We basically tell the computer what to do, right? That's, that's our main job. In modeling, what we do is there's a formal way of telling a computer what could be done. Not, not to do it, just, just you know, th here's, here's what could be done. And uh, starting with scenario-based modeling, uh, scenario-based pro uh, programming, uh, you can also tell the computer what can't be done. Okay, so these ideas of negative scenarios. So we have this um, balance between telling a computer what to do, telling a computer what not to do, and then letting the computer to find, letting the computer find a way to what it actually should do, right? And this is something that normally in, in programming paradigms that we use today, like functional programming, oop, we tell the computer exactly what to do, right? Even in functional or something, that we say, okay, we want to take this uh, collection, and I want you to stream it, and then filter it, and map it, and I don't know, split rate it, whatever. So you actually take the computer by the hand and say, okay, I want you to do this and that and that and that. And here we have this balance of allowing the computer some freedom, but also limiting that freedom where we want. Okay, so behavioral programming is somewhere in the middle. And it can be thought of as uh, modeling, can be thought of as programming, it's something that we're trying to, um, we blur this. And we're not the only programming slash executable modeling paradigm that does this, um, but this is what we do. Okay, so it's been like four minutes, we are about to see some code, because this is a, a programming conference. Um, okay, so I promised weird, and this is JavaScript, and JavaScript is weird, so I guess uh, I, I'm fine. Um, so we are using JavaScript here, we're using a Mozilla Rhino engine, for a reason that uh, we'll see later. Um, so the syntax and most of the semantics are JavaScript, but we are playing with the semantics, especially when we talk about uh, threading mod threading and concurrency. Okay, so simple hello world program. 
we have this uh, BP, WIP is the API for behavioral programming, and we register a B thread. Now, behavioral programming obviously needs to have some behaviors somewhere, and B threads, the short of uh, thread of behavior, is basically a thread, or something that's the equivalent of a thread, and it's a behavior that runs along the application. So to borrow a term from Venkat's uh, keynote yesterday, this is really an internal conversation that the application has with itself. And there are many of these conversations going around in an application, and these conversations revolve around um, events, basically. So these B-threads synchronize with each other, and when they synchronize, they basically request or wait for or block certain events. We're going to see a lot more of that soon. So we register uh, a B-thread that uh, it says hello, and then we register another B-thread that says world, and uh, we can now run it. Famous last sentences right there, but we can run it. Um, and so it says world hello. Okay, that's good. We wanted the low world, so I'm going to run it again. It says world hello, all right. I'm going to run this again. Okay, don't, don't get your random number generators on eBay. But okay, well now it says hello world. Okay, so I promised weird, but this is not weird. This is actually intended. Because what's really happening here is, uh, okay, sometimes it says hello world, sometimes it says world hello. It's actually acting, doing exactly what we wanted it to do. Because this is what's going on behind the scenes. First of all, we run the main program. This is just a JavaScript script running. And what it does is re it registers bthread to this B program. And when it terminates, then the B program runtime kicks in and starts running the B threads. Now they run in parallel. So basically doing whatever they want. And then they get to the first synchronization point. This point, they basically synchronize and they say, dear uh, B program arbiter, here's what I want uh, regarding events. I want these events to happen, that's a request. I want these events, I don't want them to happen, but if they happen, please let me know. And then there's the events that I forbid from happening. Okay, these are events that I don't want to happen in this synchronization point. And so when all the bit threads are synchronized, the central event arbiter selects an event that was requested and not blocked, and then basically all the B threads that either requested this event or waited for it get to go another round, and the rest of the B threads are remained paused in their place. And this can go on until the program terminates. B threads can spawn new B threads, they can terminate, they can call assertions, which is something we'll see later. And so, what really we ask the program to do is we ask uh, the program to, to have a hello world and an event, and a low event and a world event, but we didn't say anything about the order in which they're going to happen. So we're going to do that now. I, incidentally, I have this uh, B thread here, and what this B thread does, I'm going to uncomment it. This B thread consists of a single synchronization statement which basically says, right, I, wa I want you to wait for a hello world, and until that happens, I want you to block the world event. Okay, we're waiting for hello and blocking world. So this is, in its own, this B-thread does nothing. It just limits the way that the event arbiter can select events. That's all. If we had done a program with just this B-thread, it would immediately terminate because it doesn't do anything, it just limits the way a computer, the computer can do other things. Now if I run that, and I uh, do not type Hebrew, if I run that, um, I get hello world. Now, uh, there I run it again. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's look, looking actually quite good. And the reason this is working is because we now block the selection of the event world until uh, the, the event hello was selected. Now, uh, this is DevOps, right? So we might uh, dedicate another B thread to DevOps here. And this is basically doing the same, right? We're, we're saying, okay, I'm, I want, first of all, I'm going to wait for hello. And when hello happens, 
I want you to block world. You cannot select world until uh, the event devox is selected. So we run that, and we get a load devox world. Okay, so this happens. If we go back to some takeaways from this. First of all, you can say that this is really, there's a lot of additivity here. And I was really happy to see uh, Venkat's uh, keynote yesterday because we were kind of like hitting on some, some of the points he mentioned there. So there's a lot of additivity, there's a lot of composability, and while these uh, things are modular, like these uh, threads are modular, they run in the, on their own, the, the, the flow of events within a B thread is not affected by other B, B threads. But the way we combine them is uh, something that we have a lot of control over, and so we can create complex behaviors from simple behaviors. Also, there's an, we have this asynchronous first approach. Right? So whenever we call a B sync, the, the system basically, the B thread basically pauses, and then picks off when uh, event it was event that it requested or waited for is uh, selected. So this sounds actually quite expensive, but because we're using Rhino and its own continuations, we don't really take a, a Java thread or a B or a hardware thread for that. For that. Okay. So so it's actually quite um, it's quite cheap from a runtime perspective. We can have a lot of uh, B threads, and we don't use a lot of Java threads for that. Okay, so that's, that was a simple hello world. Now uh, let's do, uh, let's model a house. Okay, so this is the idea. We have a robot, and there's uh, the robot just roaming around the house, maybe one of those uh, autonomous um, vacuum cleaners. And we want to simulate how the robot goes around the house. So first of all, we're going to convert it to something we can actually look at. All right, um, so we have this uh, ASCII drawing of a house. Right, and if you come from an object-oriented uh, background like I did, First, uh, when I first looked at this uh, challenge, you'd start thinking about object hierarchies, right? I mean, there's, there's a house, the house is the grid, and obviously there's some cells and different types of cells, and there's a target cell and a start cell, wall cells. And so I first implemented it using this kind of idea, and then there's some maze walker that goes around and maintains a state. And about a year later, I came to this, um, this example again, and I realized I basically wrote object-oriented using behavioral framework. So now we're going to do it in the behavioral way, which might be weird. This is the idea. We're going to uh, basically iterate over the characters, and then we're going to add B threads uh, for the correct for for some characters. Now it turns out it makes more sense to model the spaces than to model the walls here. So this is what we're going to do. This is your standard um, double for loop, nested for loop, actually using var here because I didn't have a chance to not use var yet. Um, and the idea is this. Basically, if we have any of a space T or S, which are all space cells, right? We can, the robot can go into them. We're going to add a space cell, which is just adding a bit thread. We'll see that bit thread soon. And also, if, if we have uh, T there, it means it's a target cell, right? We don't want the robot to get there. So we add another B thread saying, okay, this is also a target. And if it's a start cell, we also add another behavior. So now I know I promised weirdness, but this is actually very intuitive. Because if you come, if you, if you would talk to someone that's uh, you know, not a programmer, okay, someone that's, that's not thinking in objects or in function, you'd really say, well, you know, different types of cells have different behaviors, right? We have, we add, we remove behaviors, that's, that's what we do, what, how, the way we think as humans. And this is a direct reflection of that. And also you can see that we have here uh, this idea of composition over inheritance. I mean, there's no inheritance here. And the way we refine behaviors is by adding behavior threads. Now, note that behavior threads, they can add behaviors, but they can also limit behaviors, limit existing behaviors, right? So by adding a bit thread, I can actually make things uh, more strict, or I can make them more lenient, the way I want, I need at the moment. Okay, so a space cell basically looks, looks like this. Um, we register a B thread, it has uh, parameters of the coordinates, and basically it waits for an entry in, to an adjacent cell, and once that happens, it requests an entry 
uh, basically request the robot to visit itself. Right? But it waits for any entrance. So this is a very, very lenient kind of uh, invitation. Okay? It's basically saying, you know, I see you're, you, know, you, you visited my neighbor, how about you, you come visit me? But oh, you, you, you went to visit someone else, that, that, that's completely fine. Right? And that's, not, that's not the passive aggressive completely fine. It's really completely fine that, that we don't maintain any state of how many times we asked someone to come and it didn't come. We just go back to the top of the while loop and everything is really fine. So that's a target cell, a space cell. A target cell is basically a space cell, so it has this behavior, but it also has a target cell behavior, which for the, fir when the first time it is visited, we wait for an enter event, and then we basically say, okay, I want a target found event to be selected, and also I want all other events to be blocked. So this is important because when a target cell is visited, all the neighbors of uh, that target cell are basically requesting the robot to visit them, and the system may choose uh, one of those uh, cell entry events to be selected before the target event found is uh, the target found event is selected. Right. So we want to block everything except the target found event. Now. Um, Assuming you're all uh, engineered a few systems, you probably look at the blocking of uh, all accept thing and say, well, this doesn't scale. And you're right, it doesn't. But for our uh, example here, it's fine. We don't need anything else. It's a nice utility method. Obviously, we can do finer grain uh, blocking if we need to. But for this, this works, for this small example. Um, a start cell is basically the same. It's a space cell. We had a space cell behavior, but we also had a little behavior that requesting, requesting uh, an event, uh, an entry event, because this is where the robot starts walking, right? So um, we're going to run this. Now, the way I'm going to run this, it's, it's actually a swing application. Anybody here doing swing? Yay! It's still alive, my favorite framework. Um, anyway, so this is what we're going to see. We're going to see a B, the BP codes running on top. That's a JavaScript, and it runs on top of a BPJS basically program runner, and then there's basically host uh, Java application and JVM, and then it's like turtles all the way down. Um, the connection between the host application and the BPJS runtime is basically through APIs. There's an external event queue, listener. So this is, this is a, top, a form of model-driven engineering, really. OK, so um, OK. So let's uh, see the robot in action. OK, so we have the code here, and there's a maze, and we can let the robot run, and it runs. Um, so OK, it, just, it, it basically does a random walk here. Now, if you, we take uh, a few seconds to think about what's happening. I mean, you've seen the code, right? And this is basically a robot walking between walls. But there's no walls, and there's no robot. Now, regarding the walls thing, sure, we, we, we did a reverse modeling, right? We did a negative modeling. We're modeling the spaces. OK. But there's no robot. There's actually no robot. This is a robot walking with all the walking and like none of the robot. And it, well, I think I, I de I've delivered at this point on the weirdness um, I promise. <laughs> it's. Um, but it's cool, in a way, right? Because all we really wanted from the robot is to walk. We don't model any like energy or anything like that. We just wanted the walking, and we got, that's what we got. We got only the walking. OK, so I'm going to let the robot. But, so, so this, is, but this is really weird, right? I mean, it, it's a weird paradigm. And, and the question is, why would anyone want a paradigm that, that allows ghost robots to roam mazes with like, no robots being roaming? And, the answer, and this is, I think, what got me personally excited about behavioral programming, is that this is not the weird paradigm. It's the other paradigms that are weird, really. Um, take, take a look at this simple requirement. Right? After the first three pages, I want you to clean the inkjets. Right? That's a simple IoT thing. And it turns out you can represent this pretty directly in, in behavioral programming. Right? You just wait for three print pages, and then you require 
that the clean inkjets would happen before you, any, any other page is printed. If you want to do it every time, then sure, just put it in a while loop. Right? And this is an infinite loop, but they're not that infinite in, in behavioral programming, so, so we're, we're happy with that. Um, and maybe you say, okay, I want to limit resource use. So, okay, just maintain a counter, and um, whenever the, the counter exceeds the limit, then you just, you just uh, shoot a small behavioral thread that basically blocks things once. Or maybe, uh, you know, if you run out of products P1 and P2, I don't want any other products, uh, any other orders until uh, the, the stock is renewed. So, okay, this is parameterized. We basically have uh, this block orders when out of, which is a function to return a function. That come, should come quite natural to everyone at this point. And uh, we basically wait uh, in an infinite loop, wait until we get an out of stock, and then we wait until the refill done, and until the refill done happens, we block orders. So this on itself does nothing, right? It's just a function that returns a function. But when you start the program, if you look at the lower two lines, we instantiate the requirements. Okay, we actually instantiate requirements. Now, so this is really requirements as first class citizens, if you will. So this is quite important for uh, I guess software engineering because our programs, we, re we don't write, pro I mean, we, okay, on a personal level when assuming that there's no management watching us through the internet, we write programs to like instantiate objects and do f fun stuff with functions, but normally applications should like fulfill requirements, right? And so this allows us to actually represent requirements directly. And, and the code is aligned with the requirements and this is something that's uh, very powerful for system understanding. Because a lot of time you just you look at the, at, at the code, right? You look at an object and you see all those methods and you know exactly what's happening in the, in the method. But why is it doing it? I mean, what's the big picture? And you're supposed to put it in the documentation. And I guess people do this more and more. But still, this is, it's nice to have a programmatic picture of what the big picture is. And there's another cool thing we can do. And for this, I'm going to use a very small maze. And by now we know that these mazes are, uh, this maze is, has uh, about six B threads to it. Right? There's a B thread for every th cell. There's no wall cell, so they're all enterable. And there's also two B threads, uh, one that deals with the starting and the other one that will deals with the target. So six B threads in the system. And I'm going to put them, you know, write them one uh, next to the other. And so when we start, we have all the cell B threads are waiting, so that's the four Ws there. And the start B thread is requesting an event. And also the target B thread is waiting because it just, it's waiting for an entry, right? So from here, only one thing can happen. Uh, there's just one event, and that event is the entry to cell one, to cell zero, of course. Uh, so uh, this is the only thing the program can do. And now we're in, uh, the, the robot has entered cell one. I mean, not there's a, that there's a robot here, of course, but an entrance to cell, one, to cell zero was made, and so cell one says, okay, are uh, you visiting my neighbor? How about you come visit me? And so there's only one thing that can happen here, but as we go along, you can see that we basically can traverse uh, the, the space or the, the, all the states that the system can be in. Now, this is a very small maze, and obviously um, this looks like an automaton. It is a sort of an automaton. Uh, it's possibly infinite, obviously, for uh, larger systems, and it's normally very, very large, but still, it's something, it's a graph you can reason about. And you can, for example, say, hey, this cell is not good. I, I don't want to get to this state. This is a bad state, because in this state, that, that, uh, the robot basically fell to the, to the trap. So the way we um, mark cells as bad in BPJS is basically by adding another bifred, which is what we always do. Uh, so this is another bifred. It basically it waits for a target found event, and once the target found event happens, if that happens, then it calls a false assertion, saying the robot fell into the trap. And when this happens, we are actually able to capture the, th the, the trace of events that led, into the that led to the false assertion. So it's not just saying, uh, we found the bug, it's also actually giving you the way to reproduce the bug and, and telling you how you got there. 
And um, so this is basically what we do. We just we add the robot falling, bifed to the rest of the uh, behavioral system. We traverse the graph, and then we, when we hit the fail, failed assertion, we output the trace. There's all kinds of ways to, because this state uh, search space is really big, we can uh, basically narrow it down using all kinds of assumptions, things like that. That's one thing that the Bithford, uh, that Bithford does. Um, but that's beyond the scope of a gentle introduction to be able to program it. OK, so let's see if we can keep the robot alive. Um, so instead of running this, I'm going to click verify. And this is obviously, this is very hard computationally. Uh, because what we do, we don't do any transformation or anything. We actually run the JavaScript from the continuations a few times. So if there's, there's a state with few possible, um, a few possible selections that can be made, we basically make all these selections. Oh, it's not. Nice. Okay, I mean, forget indistinguishable for magic. This, this works in live demos. I mean, that's, like that. that's how you know the technology is almost ready. Okay. So, uh, and it's also not that, it's not that hard to do, really. This, that's the Java, basically the essence of the Java code that's happening there. We instantiate a B program, we add some uh, sources, and then we just give it to a verifier, and we ask the verifier to verify it. So, um, this is a, what, what can we do with this as engineers, right? Uh, we have this B program, which is a bit of a program and a bit of a model. And I, I didn't uh, talk too much about the event selection strategy, but that's actually quite big. Because obviously the computer can decide between many events, and only it has to do all the, the spec, if you will, that uh, Harel, Moron, and Weiss came up with is um, that it has to select an event that's requested and not block. That's all. And there's a, a very large degree of freedom of what a computer can do, and obviously can cram anything you want in their AI or like reinforced learning or uh, my favorite is Java Util Random. Uh, works great. Uh, actually works great, by the way. Uh, it's, it's a good way of doing things. Um, BPJS itself ships with four different strategies. We, we can do all kind of uh, preferences and uh, saying, okay, this bit thread is more important than that bit thread. We can do a lot of things like that. So. We can take this model on its own, wrap it in a mainstream type of system, which is basically a type of model-driven uh, engineering. And so this just runs. But we can also take the same model and add some uh, assumptions and requirement methods like we've seen with the assertions, and we can verify it. Okay, so the same model, as is, we can run it, we can verify it, we can use it in, in systems, which raises the question, who cares? Right, I mean, okay, cool thing, but why, why, why is that interesting? And so, um, there's a famous quote by uh, Tony Hoare at this uh, Turing Award lecture, 1980. There are two ways of constructing a software design. One way is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies, and the other way is to make it so complicated that there are no obvious deficiencies. Right, and obviously it's much harder to do the, the, the first one. But looking at this, you know, wh why, can't, why can't we do both? Right? So the mainstream system in this type of designs is really quite simple. All it does is, is the I.O. It basically takes, it talks to the environment and it uh, either gets events, reads files, uh, reads uh, some so sensors, whatever, and generates events. And it feeds them to the model, and then the model can, uh, and then it listens to events, that, to decisions basically that the model makes, and actuates based on these decisions. And the model itself, sure, it's complex, but it's verifiable, or, I mean, there's always fine print with the uh, verification, so, at least it's partially verifiable and it's very testable because it actually does not, it has no side effects outside of itself, right? Just selects events. So you can do a lot of uh, testing based on it, even if it's not just verification or verification uh, per se. So we have this idea, this way of creating very uh, reliable systems, 
based on models that are at least partially verifiable. And okay, so where are we going with this? Um, so about a month ago, Bruno Borges wrote, uh, write the scariest tech presentation you can, uh, you can using only four words. And to which uh, Simon Ritter replied, um, JavaScript for autonomous vehicles. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what, uh, yeah, so I've uh, been there. Um, th this is a work uh, we presented, we being Joel Grenier and Gera Weiss, Avran Sadon, Saf Maron, and myself in a um, scientific conference called Models. Uh, it's actually model driven engineering tools. Uh, in Copenhagen earlier this year, it takes basically three B threads to have this uh, little rover follow the, the leading rover. Um, so this is something we can do. We are, we are actually, this is for example a, a, um, a case where the space is infinite because the rover can just go. Right? It can decide where it wants to go and make some decision, but because the length of its drive is infinite, the, the, even the first DFS iteration would be infinite. But we can cut the, the depth of the tree and so do some width traversals, and we were able to actually find all kind of race conditions in earlier models that, we, that we've done. We were able to basically prevent them and then prove that, don't, that they don't exist anymore. Uh, we currently decided to, based on Simon's feedback, obviously, um, we decided to leave this and we're, we're moving more towards the idea of onboard space controlling for, for small, uh, this is not obviously like international space station or something, it's just small space applications. Um, they're much, they sound cool and also there's no pedestrians to, to go over, so it's uh, easier for us. Uh, this is uh, based, all, all this tooling, um, and all the, these projects that you've seen here, I mean the, the, the robot and this guy, is based on the BPJS, which is a tool suite for uh, behavioral programming uh, written in Java. Uh, we created this uh, with a research group at Ben Gurion University. Uh, it's open source under the MIT license. Uh, you've seen it, it's uh, uh, embeddable or you can write for, through the command line. It's, it has academic origins, but we make a point out of making this like an industrial quality kind of thing. So we have continuous integration or continuous code coverage, unit testing, documentation. Uh, we're on GitHub, uh, we're on um, GitHub, on Maven Central. Uh, there's a lot of sample code and uh, we're using uh, the, the Rhino, Java, the Mozilla Rhino JavaScript engine. So again, this is not some, uh, it's, it's a good engine that, that you can rely on. Um, there are other tools out there too. Okay, so if you don't like JavaScript or don't like our take of it or anything, or just want to test new things, there are other tools out there and we're gonna see them, uh, I'll mention them later. Um, and again, this is, while this is new in the industry, or at least as far as I know, it's, there's a lot of scientific work uh, that went into this. And th there's a lot of papers uh, starting from uh, the 1999 paper from David Arell and uh, Werner Dam about life sequence charts, and then this book uh, of David Arell and Rami Marelli called Come Let's Play, and it's based on something called life sequence charts. It's the idea of actually graphic programming. So they have these charts and they interleave the charts. Behavioral programming itself was presented in uh, 2010 and then again 2012. BPJS is, uh, I mean, we started that project on 2017, but it's based on a lot of internal projects that we've done before. And, you know, we're in collaboration with uh, the VDRL's group and uh, Saf Maron, and we're using students, we're using, we're, okay. <laughs> Freudian sleep right there. Uh, we're, we, we're helped by students. Uh, we pay them with academic points, they're happy. Um, but uh, yeah, we're happy to also work with other people who are uh, more f f have some, I don't know. If you feel like early adopting something or, or just squishing your brain in a new way, this, this might be an, uh, a nice uh, weekend uh, study. Um, other, BPG, other BP group, okay, not BPJS, the Behavioral Programming Group, uh, there's a 
David Harrell's group at the Weizmann Institute of Science, uh, Joel Grinier at the Leibniz University of Hanover, and Luca Matias doing some React and uh, JavaScript stuff. Um, resources, we have uh, bprog.org is the main site, and contains other implementations, including C, Java, Erlang, Blockly. Uh, there's a lot of academic paper, as I said. Uh, if you search for anything there, uh, look for live sequence charts, which are the early, earlier incarnation of behavioral programming. Um, that might have been semantically inaccurate. Uh, anyway, live sequence charts or behavioral programming. Uh, we're on GitHub, uh, on a, and we have a Google group. If you like uh, live sequence charts, itself, there's Scenario Tools, uh, which is a project by Joel Grinier. Uh, they actually have a Kotlin variant at this point. So uh, they do Java and Kotlin and kind of like textual representation of sequence charts. And uh, yeah, that's uh, all I got. Mm -hmm. uh, question? Yeah, of course. I mean, it's like we're, we're, this, this says wait for a question. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so the question is, can, can, are there any domains where this type of thing is extra useful? So, this is normally good for reactive systems. So, systems that have to work with the environment and get events and react uh, to them and actuate some, something. So, so a, a robot, kind of like a, a, a roving uh, vacuum cleaner would be a good uh, example for it. But, you can also look at uh, web servers as a way of reactive system as well, right? Because they get requests and they have all this internal state. So if you can think of your system as a reactive system, especially if it has long running processes, this would be an ideal match, I think. Um, yep. Yes? What? Oh, so if I have a lot of activities together, yeah. what happens? Okay, so if I have a lot of activities together, I, I, what? So if you have a lot of activities that run in parallel and they're similar, we've seen something along these lines here. What happens is you can have, um, you can parameterize this. So when you start the event, you give it some ID, and then all these events have a start with an ID. The, their name can start with this ID. I mean, we, we also have a, a data field attached to events, so we can do something that's more structured. But if all this, the, the uh, instance of this B thread is uh, parameterized with that type of ID, then you can have multiple events running, multiple threads running at the same time, and they don't step on each other's toes. Okay, it's kind of like the, the cells in the maze example. They're all the same code, same function, but they're parameterized differently, so we're fine. For instance, with the maze, if you have two robots, you instantiate two times the... Um, yes, th there's, a, there's a lot of bifids. There's a lot of bifids, and we, w this is why we're really happy with Rhino, because we're, we're able to use continuations now, uh, instead of waiting for Project Loom to actually have continuations or fibers. Um, yeah. Uh, how do you organize the code? Because mm. now you have only events, and how do you tie them to, to? How do you classify them and keep them organized so that you know that when you have to there's a bug? How do you pinpoint exactly which event I have to go fix because something went wrong and I don't know exactly in the chain of? Uh, okay. So so if I, if I an assert like I, I got to a failed assertion and now I need to understand what happened it's like how? On a global uh, on a global aspect on a more. Um, have a big base of code, how do you keep it tidy, how do you... Okay, huge question, you huge question, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so the question was, how, how do I keep the code tidy? Um, and the answer is, it, it's a new paradigm, so that's one of the exciting things. Uh, I have no idea how to do this. I mean, we, we, we experiment with stuff, I mean, it's, it's basically code, right? And you can add, my, my current take, which is like completely mine. And again, this is from a big group and there's a lot of 
opinions. I tried to put different modules in different um, files and then join those files when I read. And so I, I read the program from many small files. And so I can turn on and off things quite easily. But it, it's an open question. OK. Any more questions? OK, so thank you. And uh, do talk if, if you're bored this weekend, this is uh, maybe something you might uh, want to do.